Americans approximately September 12, 2001, almost 60 years ago now, this administration has assured us it would institute and uphold policies and procedures that would keep Americans safe. Except for that sick guy who wanted to fly to his wedding. In our number three story tonight, one of the administration's first responders when it comes to biological warfare, which can include the use of infectious diseases, has been put to the test. Specifically, could the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in conjunction with the rest of the U.S. government, stop one man carrying a deadly disease from entering the country? The answer was no. And today was a day for excuses. His for why he did it, and the government for why it failed to stop him, even though it knew exactly who he was. We'll get to the security and political ramifications in just a moment, but first, the facts and figures in this report from NBC's Robert Bazell. The unidentified 32-year-old man remains locked in this Atlanta hospital this evening. Today it was revealed he took seven flights between May 12th and May 24th. CDC officials are looking to test the approximately 90 people, the crew members, and those who sat in the rows close to him on the two transatlantic flights. Officials say the chances are that TB did not spread. We can offer a certain level of reassurance, but the reassurance will really come with the investigation. The man's saga began last January, when a routine chest x-ray during a physical revealed a spot. Subsequent tests showed it was tuberculosis, even though he has never had symptoms. As soon as he was diagnosed, health officials in Fulton County, Georgia, got involved. Skin tests showed good news. He had not infected his fiance, whom he was planning to marry in Europe. We advised him not to travel. I mean, I didn't uh, get into his, uh, his personal uh, uh, plans. So he took off anyway. By the time he got to Rome on May 21st, tests showed just how dangerous the TV strain is. And federal officials wanted him in isolation right away. We were exploring all sorts of options to remove the, the public health concerns that he represented. But in an interview with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the man said he had no intention of going into an Italian hospital. I cooperated with everything other than the whole solitary confinement in Italy thing, he said. So he flew to Prague and on to Montreal before driving to the United States, where he voluntarily checked into a New York City hospital. The man will soon be treated at National Jewish Hospital in Denver. Doctors there say the risk he infected anyone is low, but because the disease is so hard to treat, you can't take chances. In a way, it's an inverted lottery. You probably won't lose, but if you lose, you could lose big. Extremely drug-resistant TB is rare in the United States. No one knows where this man got it, but he did say he had been on a business trip to Asia. Allison? Bob Bazell in New York, thanks to you. And joining us now to address some of the questions raised by this case is Rachel Maddow, whose program airs every night on Air America Radio. Rachel, nice to see you. Hi, Allison. Nice to see you, too. So in your opinion, what could or should the government have done differently without running afoul of civil rights concerns? The first thing the government should have done is have a plan. The single scariest thing about this entire response and everything we've learned in the last two days was the statement by the head of the CDC, Julie Gerberding, when she actually said, we just kind of had to make up the plan as we went along. There have been 17 cases of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis in the United States just since 2000. 17 cases, a dozen and a half cases. A public health system that doesn't have a plan to deal with that, that told the guy, ah, maybe we think it would be best if you didn't travel, but then didn't let him know about those test results until he was already overseas. The public health system here is the scariest thing about this case. The thing that was very scary to me is it just announced a huge hole in American security. If you're on a no-fly list, which this guy was, and you know it, you can take a flight to an adjacent country and then drive across the Canadian border, which made me wonder, have we ignored security on the borders to the north while trying to build fences in the south? You know, it's interesting. A lot of people in the, in the border regions, in, for example, the border regions of Texas and Arizona, local officials there have pointed out the contrast in our security on the southern and northern borders. But this is actually a little bit scary on both sides of the security issue because, sure, you had him able to drive into the United States after evading the no-fly list restrictions by flying into Canada. On the other hand, we also learned that health agencies can put people on the terrorism no-fly list. It kind of makes you wonder if every agency can do that. Like if you ran afoul of the faith-based initiatives office, if they could no-fly list you or something. So, there, I mean, there's concerns, all sorts of stuff that we've learned about um, through this very case. But, 
you know, the response to a, an airborne transmitted multi-drug resistant potentially fatal virus is the reason that we have government at a very basic level. It's the reason that libertarians don't get elected to office. You need to have a government competent enough to recognize this as a threat, to isolate it when it happens, and to either neutralize it or at least contain it. And the public health system in this country failed at every level in this case. One of the things that's interesting, well not interesting, but perhaps one of the illuminating things after 9-11 was the issue of coordination between different agencies. What do you think this whole episode says about the coordination between federal agencies and coordination between nations? Well, even within the public health system, just within the United States, even if you don't take into account Italy and the other countries involved here, we still haven't heard a clear story from public health officials about what the patient was advised, what he was told he should or should not do, how seriously those restrictions were communicated to him. They still haven't even got the story straight just in terms of the United States. A big issue about how we're kept safe is not just that we stop threats before they arise, not just that we kill terrorists or that we uh, infiltrate terrorist cells. It's that when something happens, we recognize it as a threat and we have core government functions that can respond to it. That's true for transportation, communications, public health. It's as true for terrorism as it is for hurricanes and it, as it is for, for avian flu or, or, or tuberculosis. We need to have resilient systems that can take a punch, contain a threat, and respond. Rachel Maddow, The Rachel Maddow Show on Air America. Thanks for spending some time with us, Rachel. Thanks, Allison.